Since 2018, China's manufacturing demand has plummeted by 40 percent, leading the fate of the Communist Party to hang in the balance. Geopolitical analyst Peter Zeihan predicts that China may disintegrate within the next decade. Peter is an American geopolitical analyst and author, discussing China and its economic achievements. He states this could be China's last decade, maybe even less. He dismisses the notion of China becoming the world's leading economic and military power. He also refutes claims of China being a technological leader and manufacturing powerhouse. He argues that the idea of China soon holding the global currency, thereby defeating the U.S., is ludicrous. As globalization collapses, countries must ensure their own resource supply and do so against a backdrop of an aging and diminishing population. For China, this is a huge problem as it relies on trade to meet its people's needs and keep the economy running. After World War II, international trade flourished, industrialization took hold. And thousands of economies merged into one global entity. Consequently, countries could acquire anything from anywhere and sell anything to anywhere, creating the integrated, technologically advanced world we know today. Yet, not all countries are equal in the face of globalization's collapse. Some regions possess unique economic advantages, allowing them to be self-sufficient. For example, the North American Free Trade Agreement (NAFTA). Between the United States, Canada, and Mexico, represents a third of the global economy. The United States, with its military might, can secure the necessary raw materials such as lithium for electric vehicle batteries from sources like Argentina and Chile. With a strong agricultural and consumer base, open international markets, and the ability to seek resources globally, the U.S. can achieve its economic growth goals. China, however, cannot. China was once the fastest-growing society in history, but it will face consumer and labor issues in the coming decade. If China survives this decade, it would indeed be a miracle. Why is this the case? In the 1970s, China had a population of 800 million, predominantly young. Founding president of Communist China Mao Zedong, fearing an overpopulation crisis, implemented the one-child policy. What followed was the swiftest decline in birth rate ever seen in any country, in any region, at any time in human history. The decline in birth rate is not just tied to the one-child policy, but also to globalization. As globalization led to an increase in specialization, people began to work in manufacturing and service sectors, primarily based in cities where it costs money to make money. Children, rather than becoming free labor as in an agricultural society, became financial burdens. Consequently, urbanization that came along with globalization led people to have fewer children. China was late to join the globalization party. But because of prior experiences with urbanization, the pace was rapid. In just one generation, the Chinese went from having an average of five to seven children to a mere 0.7 in cities like Shanghai and Beijing. Globalization has led to population collapse in many countries, and this phenomenon is particularly severe in China. China no longer has enough young people to drive consumption and construction. Since 2000, China's labor costs have skyrocketed 15-fold. Although they claim to become the greatest nation on earth, they lack the next generation to back up this ambition. According to the 2000 census, the number of newborns in China was overstated by 100 million. In fact, the current number of young people is far less than reported. China's labor costs can no longer compete with other countries. And the aging population will only exacerbate this issue. Therefore, it is predicted that China's economy may disintegrate before the end of this decade. In China, agriculture has always been inefficient and heavily dependent on human labor. It's reminiscent of Egypt around 4,000 BC, with people working diligently under the guidance of the state, leading a self-sufficient life. But now people have moved into cities and haven't farmed for more than 20 years. Many have forgotten how to farm, and moreover, much of China's farmland is not suitable for mechanization. These are all significant issues. 
On the other hand, the majority of China's land is extremely infertile. The severe drought in 2022 made it so that even irrigated land couldn't support crop growth. Therefore, China is now heavily dependent on food imports to sustain its 1.4 billion population. If globalization collapses and trade halts, where would China's food come from, and how would society function? China is under immense pressure right now, as if a loaded gun is pointed at its head. We are witnessing a dual crisis in population and food supply, and we might also see the collapse of the manufacturing sector and the political system. From the perspective of manufacturing, the shift in supply chains is a big problem. We saw this year that Apple CEO Tim Cook visited China. It's clear that Apple intends to move its business operations out of the country. In fact, many Western companies had begun to withdraw from China even before the outbreak of the pandemic and the trade war. Now, companies like Apple, which still have a significant amount of their manufacturing operations in China, are likely few and far between. Therefore, China could potentially cause some disruption, even unimaginable trouble for Apple. While this might be a trade secret that we can't confirm, one could imagine that without a substantial cash reserve, Apple could face a systemic crisis. It was only a little over a year ago that Apple began considering moving its manufacturing to Vietnam. They might be the last company to realize the potential risks in China. Apple had chosen to stay because they believed that globalization was underpinned by the security order of the United States. However, they didn't realize that the U.S. might not be able to fully control the order of globalization. Apple realized that perhaps they shouldn't have 91% of their supply chain tied to China. No matter how quickly they attempt to relocate now, they can't cut ties with China fast enough. It would take at least five years for Apple to establish a supply chain in India. Tim Cook expressed his desire to pull out from China, but he is dealing with Chinese leaders who grew up during the Cultural Revolution. If Xi Jinping can retain his power at the expense of famine, strategic failure, and deindustrialization, he might not consider it a big deal. The strategies that Cook could employ in a normal country might not work in China. The people sitting across the table from him might not be able to help at all. Driving from Vietnam's Hanoi to Ha Long Bay, one would pass by Foxconn's facilities, which are quite impressive in size. However, for the most part, they are assembly facilities rather than manufacturing ones. This means that in this 91% of the supply chain, various parts arrive in China to be assembled into another part. Then dispatched to be integrated into yet another part. This process repeats over and over. Although assembly is a crucial part of the manufacturing process, it's simpler than other aspects. Overall, for the past 20 years, Chinese people have provided the fingers and eyes for these assembly processes, rather than opting for automation due to the abundance of labor. China is also grappling with an energy crisis. China needs to import 75% of its oil, with most of it shipped from the Persian Gulf or even further places. The rest comes from Russia, but this oil is primarily extracted from Siberian permafrost, and Russia doesn't possess advanced techniques for its extraction. They used to rely on foreign oil engineers, but following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, those foreign engineers, many of whom were from English-speaking countries and worked in the American shale gas industry, have left. Therefore, China's challenges in terms of energy are significant. China's economic situation is also in poor shape, due to pandemic lockdowns. China's supply chains have been paralyzed, with many foreign businesses moving their supply chains to other countries. The result is a significant drop in orders for China. In reality, the lockdowns were necessary because China's vaccines were ineffective, and the only way to mitigate the spread of the virus was through lockdowns. But these lockdowns severed the supply chains between China and the rest of the world. Weakening China's exports and manufacturing industry, the legitimacy of the Communist Party's rule rooted in China's economy might now be jeopardized. The current social environment in China is such that personal worship for Xi Jinping is deepening, making China's policies unchangeable. Absurd situations can be seen, 
such as airport staff disinfecting runways just because they were instructed to do so. In a country where resources are wasted and rational decisions cannot be made, how can it function effectively? China's political system could also lead to a severe crisis in the next five to ten years. After Mao Zedong's death, Deng Xiaoping took over. The leadership then was a team of political elites, as Deng did not want China to return to Mao's one-man government and to the horrors of the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. He turned China into an industrial powerhouse. Deng then handed power to Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, each of whom led the country for ten years and were selected while Deng was still alive. Hu Jintao knew exactly when his term would start and end. He was aware of this fifteen years before he took the job. Deng, realizing he couldn't predict the future and select the next generation leader, led Jiang and Hu factions together to select a new person, and that was Xi Jinping. Initially, it was thought that Xi would maintain a balance between these two major factions. However, over the following five years, he crushed any other independent sources of power within the country, whether it be the business world, local governments, or bureaucracies. At present, Xi Jinping remains unchallenged. We are seeing a multitude of unwise decisions being made at the highest level, with no one daring to question Xi. This explains the emergence of absurd government actions like spy balloons. In finance, agriculture, manufacturing, subsidies, and governance, similarly foolish decisions are being made. The CCP, in its quest to take Taiwan, has been accumulating military power for many years. However, the path it has chosen is wrong in many aspects. The CCP's two assumptions are fundamentally flawed. Firstly, they believe that capturing Taiwan would be easy. This is not the case. Taiwan wouldn't be as easily overtaken as Ukraine. After all, there's no strait between Ukraine and Russia, and Russia still struggles significantly. Once a war is initiated against Taiwan, it will mark the end of a modern, industrialized, united China. Secondly, they assume that Russia's weaponry is excellent, and by spending 30 trillion U.S. dollars to manufacture similar weapons, they could take Taiwan. The reality, however, is that this knockoff approach is causing them regret. If the CCP instigates a war, it is akin to committing suicide, as they lack control over maritime territories, which are the sources of all their exports, raw materials, and energy. The CCP would face deindustrialization, and famine would occur within less than a year. The destruction caused by sanctions could be four times as substantial as caused by war. China's economy may seem robust now, but it's built on a fragile foundation. Many people compare China's economic growth to that of the U.S. in the 19th century, but this comparison is misleading. The U.S.'s growth in the 19th century was based on abundant resources. While China's economic growth is based on cheap labor and external resources, these are fundamentally different. If China loses these resources, its economy might collapse immediately. Most Chinese don't even fully understand the basic concepts regarding enterprise or citizenship, let alone how they would make decisions after losing contact with foreign companies, technology, and markets, and changing their entire development model. Currently, China is facing multiple crises, including population collapse, a food crisis, manufacturing collapse, and political collapse, all of which point to a possible imminent disintegration of the nation. China is like a giant on the brink of collapse, and the world is closely watching the impact this collapse could bring. What we need to do now is prepare for the potential repercussions resulting from China's possible downfall.